Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our latest uh, peer analysis and balance sheet strategies webinar. Um, my name is Andrew Palo, and I am the Director of Member Strategies and Solutions here at the bank. And I'm going to take us through three parts uh, today about uh, where we'll be discussing what's going on uh, in the market that's relevant for depositories. Not much happening with the yield curve these days, right? Uh, we'll take a look at some key trends that are happening on the call reports of our members here uh, in New England. And then lastly, we'll discuss some key balance sheet strategies uh, that we uh, can consider. So uh, uh, if you have any questions at any point, uh, feel uh, free to submit it in the, in the chat and we'll uh, address it as we go. So before we uh, jump in, just a, a little bit of a lighthearted uh, uh, start about inflation. Uh, is it transitory? Is it not? Uh, so uh, as you can see, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, Al Horford dunking on uh, uh, the, the Milwaukee Bucks here, uh, every month that uh, another high inflation reading comes, uh, it, it dampens the idea that the inflation is in fact uh, transitory. Uh, but uh, given how that series was a little touch and go last week, thankfully the Celtics uh, prevailed, uh, I had to have a backup uh, uh, thing to talk about. So that's where... Uh, that the, the Costco 150 hot dog comes into play. So, uh, you know, that is the counter argument to uh, inflation being uh, transitory. So let's jump into the real stuff here. So, uh, you know, so, so the first section, we're going to talk about uh, the markets and uh, the economy, and we're going to go forward, not backwards here. So we're going to talk about a little bit uh, about uh, the Fed, mortgages, rates, volatility, credit, inflation, uh, and a little bit of everything. So, uh, let's jump in with our first uh, poll question. Uh, we'll dust off the crystal ball and we'll ask where do we think Fed funds range will be at the end of 2022? And remember, uh, at the present, uh, we are uh, at 75 to 100 basis points after the most recent 50 basis point hike. Uh, and we have five more meetings uh, in this calendar year. So we'll give it a minute or two uh, for some of the answers to come in. Okay, looks like just about everybody is in, so we will close it and share. And hopefully we can see the results here. Uh, but what we have is 45% of folks think uh, that we'll be in that two to two and a half percent range, five to six more uh, hikes. So another 50 basis point hike uh, somewhere along the way. Uh, 12%, 175 to 2%. Uh, so uh, an expectation that hiking, uh, excuse me, that the Fed tilted a little more hawkish too quickly. And then 30%, two and a half to three, 12%, uh, three and above. So we will be sure to hold everybody to those votes uh, when we get to the end of this year. So we'll hide the results, get back to the presentation. So. Short-term yields. So if we look back over the last uh, few months here, it's been quite a ride for the front end of the yield curve, how we went from a market expectation of really no hikes on the horizon to where we are today, where it's seeming very likely that we will hit or blow through uh, that, that two to two and a half percent neutral rate that the Fed talks about, uh, and we'll be there relatively soon. So we've seen over a hundred basis points of shocks uh, at the six and 12 month uh, tenors. Uh, although as you'll see by looking at the two most recent month ends, uh, some of that uh, persistent rise in rates has really cooled off, uh, right? The six month treasury has uh, uh, flattened out and has been around that 140 level uh, at the last uh, two instances here. So the first thing to, that, that jumps out about the yield curve right now is that there's some really funky things going on uh, at the short end of the yield curve. So uh, what we have here uh, are some, over, some key overnight rates uh, as well as the one month treasury bill. So uh, there, there's two things that quote unquote shouldn't uh, really happen. So you shouldn't see SOFR, 
which is uh, market participant to market participant uh, repo transactions. You shouldn't see that tra trade below uh, the reverse repo program, which is doing repo with the Fed. Uh, but you can see the glow green dot so far is, is below the, the RRP floor of 80 basis points. The second thing that shouldn't probably be happening is that TBO rates, uh, which is the US credit as the counterparty to that transaction, uh, trading below the RRP as well, which is that's US credit, uh, US treasury credit, but it's overnight. And you know, really the only time you should see that is if you think rates are going to be coming down uh, pretty fast and furious, and that's not the case. In fact, it's it's a complete 180 degrees from what the market expectation uh, is. So there's two things that are driving that right now, and one is a lack of supply, and one is a lack of access. So on the lack of supply, uh, uh, most recently uh, we saw higher than expected tax receipts uh, come in to um, uh, build up the treasury's coffers. So the, there's been less need for treasury bill issuance. So that has has driven rates down. In terms of the lack of access, uh, not all participants can access that RRP program. Uh, so uh, you know, think about uh, you know money market funds who are envious of banks and credit unions able to deposit um, excess cash uh, endlessly in uh, interest on reserves at 90 basis points. So that's where uh, some of that uh, divergence uh, occurs. And uh, we'll come back to this later, but these types of dislocations has be have benefits in terms of uh, what that means for advanced pricing. So uh, certainly uh, one of the, the big arrows in the quiver for the Fed is uh, rate hikes, and they've begun to do that. And the, the other big tool that uh, they can utilize uh, is shrinking their balance sheet or quantitative uh, tightening. So. Uh, here we can see the, the the enormous rise in the Fed's MBS and Treasury holdings uh, over the last two decades. So we saw that first big jump uh, in the 08 crisis, and then we saw it again in 2020 and 2021. Uh, so in terms of uh, normalizing that size, uh, you know, it's not just as simple as saying, oh, okay, well, we'll just let the short stuff roll off, because we've highlighted some of the key stats in terms of the makeup. We can see that 21% uh, of the Treasury holdings uh, are less than one year. So, um, you know, if they were to let those roll off, well, you're 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 barely making a dent in in, in the size, uh, but also you're contributing to what we talked about in the previous slide of, um, you know, creating distortions uh, in terms of supply and demand. The second part um, of that is uh, when we think about the mortgage uh, side of the holdings, and uh, everyone here who is involved in the ALM process uh, is intimately aware that uh, when you consider that 75% of the Fed's holdings are an MBS of one and a half, two and two and a half percent coupons, there's not gonna be a lot of voluntary uh, prepayments and cash flow uh, coming off of those portfolios. So, so that's why uh, that they are uh, publicly talking about selling MBS securities. And you know the, the Fed is not really in the business of upsetting and surprising markets. So that's why you see the discussion taking place in public forums, uh, putting out those those trial balloons uh, to talk and, and and prime the pump, if you will, uh, to, to make sure that the market is comfortable with the idea of the Fed potentially selling mortgages. So uh, rates, it's not been a good uh, few months to be a fixed rate bond or loan. So we went back and looked at uh, through April, uh, every year going back for the last 60 years, um, the move in yield for the three-year part of the curve and the 10-year part of the curve. And what we see is that it's been historically uh, bad. Uh, it's the largest uh, move in rates for the three-year tenor uh, over the last 60 years and second worst uh, for the 10-year. And it's kind of ironic uh, that in the period of high inflation uh, where uh, you know intuitively cash is not good to hold, that uh, cash has outperformed uh, other uh, longer uh, fixed income instruments. So turning to the mortgage side, uh, you know, mortgage rates have not been immune to the move in the treasury yield curve. Uh, but interestingly, and we pointed this out uh, at our last webinar in February, uh, that something, again, that quote unquote shouldn't be happening is happening. That as uh, the yield curve moves higher, uh, that 
should lead to mortgage spreads tightening because there's less prepayment risk. And that's obvious prepayment risk is obvious, obviously the big risk when you're talking about mortgage loans or mortgage-backed securities. Uh, so here we're looking at the 30-year mortgage rate as well as the, the spread on that mortgage uh, versus the seven-year treasury. And uh, where we are today uh, is not only on the higher end of yield, uh, north of 5% than where we have been uh, recently, but also the spread has widened out to uh, uh, nearly 250 basis points of spread. And that is uh, uh, a completely different environment uh, than where we were in 2021. That's where you can see in the bottom left uh, where not only was the yield low, but the spread was narrow. Um, so uh, we'll get into more of this later, uh, but this uh, th this puts retaining fixed rate mortgages uh, in a much more attractive light. Uh, talking about credit, um, you know, they have uh, credit has seen some of the disturbances uh, that the rates market and the mortgage markets have seen as well. So here we're looking at two different measures of of credit. One would be uh, corporate bond spreads, so uh, hedging out. Uh, the interest rate risk part of, of corporate bonds, but also the spread between three-month classic advances uh, and three-month LIBOR. So that's a, a, a proxy for short-term funding stress. Uh, so what we see here is that in February and March, uh, as the uh, situation in Russia and Ukraine uh, uh, amped up, uh, that uh, as is often the case with those ge geopolitical events, there's a flight to quality. So we saw uh, credit uh, weaken uh, relative to uh, safer alternatives. And uh, uh, I'll point out now for a third time, uh, this has implications for uh, advanced pricing uh, and opportunities. Interest rate volatility. Interest rate volatility is extremely high right now. Uh, and there's there's many fancy and scientific ways that you can gauge and, and measure rate volatility, but I'll, I'll offer up this this pretty straightforward way that you can get a feel for how volatile things are in the rate market right now, uh, is that uh, simply put, rates are making bigger moves on a much more frequent basis. So you see uh, along the right-hand side, what we've been experiencing in the last few months, uh, the day-to-day -day moves have paled in comparison to what we have seen uh, in 2020 and 2021. So inflation, uh, you know, we're contractually obligated to uh, talk about uh, inflation because uh, that's all you hear about these days. Uh, so, uh, you know, one interesting way to look at, uh, at this, uh, the, the Atlanta Fed uh, has a neat dashboard uh, that, that slices and dices CPE and CPI, the headline numbers that you see out there, and uh, looks at outliers, looks at uh, some of the, 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 the categories that are more sensitive to inflation. Uh, and then others that are uh, less so, a little more uh, non-cyclical. And uh, any way you look at it, uh, you know, uh, inflation is running uh, much, much higher than where the expectation would be uh, relative to uh, what would contribute to a, a, a 2% uh, core PCE, which is the target that the Fed uh, discusses. Our last thing for this section is uh, the consumer balance sheet. And I think uh, all of our institutions uh, really have a vested interest in in, in the health of consumers uh, as it relates to uh, both sides of the balance sheet. So we're looking at uh, credit card debt here, and we can see that uh, after the depths of uh, 2020, whether it was reduced spending or stimulus, uh, that led to a, a delevering of the consumer balance sheet, uh, that we have uh, seen uh, uh, a reversal of that trend, where the, uh, the, the big blue line over there uh, all the way to the right is showing that uh, year over year, uh, total consumer credit card debt uh, was up uh, 9%. And uh, looking at year, year over year uh, is typically more instructive than a quarter over quarter because you do have some seasonality effect. Uh, you'll notice here that uh, the first quarter typically has uh, drawdowns in, in debt, uh, makes sense with uh, you know paying off holiday spending and, and, and things of the sort. So uh, let's uh, jump into uh, what's happening on the balance sheets of our, our banks and credit unions uh, here in New England. So uh, we're, we're getting very close to not uh, being able or not having to highlight trends in something as mundane as cash sitting on the balance sheet. So uh, in this last quarter, we saw a continuation, uh, continuing of the normalization of cash on the balance sheet, more so in banks uh, than in credit unions. So uh, all throughout this section, 
you, when you see blue, that means banks, and when you see green, uh, that'll be credit unions. Uh, so we can see that the median uh, and the, the 20th percentile of, of bank members saw cash come down pretty significantly, uh, you know, about two per, uh, one, one and a half to two and a half percent. Um, where with credit unions is a little bit different that the middle of the road credit union uh, didn't see the same level of decline in cash. But uh, more importantly, you saw some of the, the, the big, big outliers, uh, the folks who have been sitting on, on an awful lot of cash uh, through the last couple of quarters uh, have, have trended back down towards uh, normalization. Now, what is driving uh, that uh, normalization of cash? Um, well, the first thing uh, that jumps out is deposit growth has slowed. So here we're looking at the most recent uh, quarter over quarter deposit growth numbers on the, the y-axis and on the x-axis is the first quarter of last year. And uh, so essentially, if you are below that, uh, that diagonal line there, that means that you had better growth in 21 than you have had in 2022. And you can see that for most, that is the case. Uh, credit unions have uh, had a little bit better on the deposit growth side uh, than banks, uh, and that is evidenced by looking at that text box in the top uh, left-hand corner, which shows that uh, for 31% of banks, uh, they saw a quarter-over-quarter -quarter decline uh, in deposit levels, where it was just 4% of credit unions. What's driving cash lower uh, coming from the asset side? Uh, so. Uh, I, I would imagine everybody on this call would prefer to see the uh, triangles above the bars. And the triangles relate to uh, the loan growth rate uh, and the bars relate to the asset growth rate. So when the triangle's above the bar, uh, that means that your loans are growing faster than your assets uh, and you're not uh, uh, putting excess funds into cash or investments. Uh, but because of the historic nature of the deposit growth, uh, it was awfully difficult for, for loan growth uh, to keep up. And uh, even if you look at all the way in the left-hand side, uh, that 6% uh, loan growth in June of 2020 for banks, uh, well, there's, you know, as we all know, there's an asterisk there because that was PPP loans. Uh, so that wasn't, uh, you know, core traditional uh, types of loans. So uh, what the, the, the takeaway for this most recent quarter is that we saw loan growth uh, as high as it's been since the onset of the pandemic for both banks and credit unions. And for banks in particular, you can see we had that optimal scenario of the gap between loan growth and asset growth. So 1% loan growth and only a half a percent uh, growth in assets. So uh, certainly there's some uh, remixing of the balance sheet occurring as well, uh, that it's not just uh, uh, you know, net uh, gross activity coming in, but also uh, turning some of that cash and securities uh, into loans, which is a, um, uh, a good thing. So this is interesting, and this is uh, a case where what I thought I was going to see uh, going in was completely different than what uh, the results told us. So in terms of uh, uh, where the deposit growth was coming from, um, you know, we had a suspicion that it was going to be more, from more commercially oriented institutions. Uh, and uh, you know, the call reports uh, don't lay it out uh, uh, as as we as analysts uh, would as neatly as we would like it to see. So uh, we used residential loan concentration as a proxy for is the institution resi, you know, retail focused or are they commercially focused? And the theory was that uh, the folks with uh, better growth would have been um, uh, would be more residential focused or or uh, the outflows would have been driven by, said another way, the outflows would have been driven by uh, more commercially oriented um, institutions where, you know, all it takes is a couple of business uh, 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 customers uh, to, to withdraw deposits to, to really move the needle. But what we saw was in fact the opposite of that. So uh, the banks who had negative deposit growth were more uh, residential focused. Uh, and the folks who had uh, exceptional deposit growth in advance of four um, percent in the quarter uh, were more commercially oriented. They has had uh, less residential uh, on the balance sheet. So uh, an interesting and, and odd dynamic, I think. Uh, CDs, uh, 
you know, they're still uh, off the radar for both uh, our member institutions and probably uh, for, for customers as well, uh, even with uh, a little bit of a tick up in rates. Uh, but I would highlight uh, the, the pie charts on the long the right hand side, and you can see the maturity distributions uh, in terms of the, the heavy, heavy emphasis uh, on the inside of one year bucket. Uh, and that's not just from the passage of time and, and uh, you know, reduction in the size of those portfolios uh, that, um, you know, that, that the shortening has occurred. That, that, that's been going on for a, a long, long time. Back to the loan side, uh, you know, in terms of the, some of the key loan categories that we look at uh, on the growth side, uh, another strong quarter for both uh, CRE growth for banks as well as uh, auto loans uh, for uh, credit unions, uh, with Rhode Island banks leading the way, uh, followed by um, uh, Vermont and Massachusetts on the CRE side. And on the auto loan side, uh, Connecticut credit, credit unions had a uh, exceptional quarter. Uh, and for the first time in uh, over a year and a half, uh, surpassing the growth uh, in auto loan activity uh, from our uh, credit unions up in Maine. So here is uh, a uh, very important chart to consider uh, when we're talking about uh, price competition. So uh, here we're looking at all our members, uh, loan to deposit ratio versus cash to assets. And uh, when you think about your local markets, uh, those two metrics are really going to determine or should determine uh, who's gonna be aggressive on price uh, on the loan side uh, and then coming soon, uh, competition on the deposit pricing. So if you uh, are, are where it's annotated with the letter B, uh, so someone with uh, you know 6% cash and 85% loan to deposit ratio, congratulations, you are uh, an above average uh, institution um, presently. However, uh, look at that annotation for A. That is where you would have to be to be above average 1231.19 pre-pandemic. So close to or north of 100% loan to deposit ratio, uh, as well as cash uh, inside of uh, three, 4%. So uh, there's still a, a long way to go to get back to what most would consider to be uh, normal in terms of uh, on balance sheet liquidity. And uh, you know, so uh, when we uh, put together slide decks ahead of our uh, visits uh, for our relationship managers out to members, uh, you know, we have a version of this chart that's a little less noisy and, and, and it's more customized and to your profile. So whether it's main banks or Western Mass credit unions under one billion uh, and it's annotated. So uh, it's something that, you know, when we talk to ALCO uh, groups and, and boards of directors, that it gains an awful lot of traction uh, being able to see, uh, you know, where uh, uh, other banks or credit unions in your area uh, our position balance sheet wise and how it how it reconciles with what you're seeing on the on the pricing activity. So uh, if you're interested in that, shoot us a note and we're, we'd be happy to uh, to put that together and share that with you. Interest rate risk profile. So this is uh, this is not call report data. This is but this is uh, one of my favorite things that uh, uh, we're able to take a look at. So the OCC puts together uh, an IRR statistics report uh, every year where uh, you know, they, they uh, compile the ALM results and, and inputs uh, to, to show uh, what their member banks uh, look like. So uh, when looking at the 12-month uh, earnings at risk profile uh, in the various rate shocks, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, folks continue to be uh, well positioned uh, for rising rates, at least parallel uh, simulations. Um, Look at the bottom uh, where we can see the deposit betas uh, as well as the deposit average lives. And I think this is useful uh, for those of you, uh, you know, as we're assessing uh, what assumptions you're putting in going forward for your uh, uh, deposit uh, portfolios. And you can see, uh, you know, such numbers like 35% uh, deposit betas for the, the money market accounts, uh, and then even things like the non-interest bearing uh, uh, checking accounts, uh, five uh, five year average life assumption uh, in the in the median case. So uh, uh, very interesting data here. So uh, loan yields. So we've seen some 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 good things happening with line, loan growth. We've seen the deposit portfolio continue to look like it's in good shape. Uh, but uh, 
you know, the benefits of rising rates haven't flowed through yet uh, on the loan side. So whether that's a, a effect of the, you know, the, the reinvestment or the the activity of the you know the net growth activity not quite being uh, to to where it needs to be, but we can see that uh, quarter over quarter uh, loan yields uh, uh, continue to drop. Uh, so uh, you know we may see some help uh, in the next uh, quarter or two in terms of uh, repricing of floating rate loans, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know as loans roll off and when you when you think about the median loan yield for banks and credit unions in that mid to low to mid uh, 4% range, uh, given where we are now uh, with the intermediate part of the yield curve, uh, that uh, the, the next loan coming on the book uh, very well might be uh, above um, the loan rolling off. So that's a, that's a net positive thing for margin. Where we have seen some, some positive repricing trends has been in the investment portfolio. So uh, you know we track what percentage of members saw their book yields improve uh, quarter over quarter. And uh, starting in mid-2021, we started to see more and more members. So, uh, you know, there's uh, increasing yields. And there was two parts of that. It was one, as market rates started to lift, uh, just the simple act of reinvesting your cash flows led to higher yields. And then the other part of that is that we've talked about in previous instances where um, there's been significant growth in the investment portfolio. So uh, the, 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 the positive timing effects of turning excess cash into investments when yields are higher is a, a net good thing. But in the most recent quarter, uh, two thirds of members uh, saw their invest, investment portfolio yields uh, uh, rise. And for the purposes of this analysis, there's no differentiation between uh, you know, a one basis point improvement or a 20 basis point improvement. But uh, given the yield, uh, market yield improvements we've seen of late, uh, I would go on the limb and say in the, when we look at the second quarter data in a couple months that uh, we're going to see an awful lot of uh, uh, big improvements in investment portfolio yields. Unrealized gains and losses. Uh, you know, I think uh, we're all familiar with the math and the accounting uh, that uh, unrealized losses shouldn't be the end of the world. But I have sympathy for uh, all of uh, our CFOs and treasurers and the like who have to sit in, in ALCO and uh, talk or be cross-examined uh, about unrealized losses. So, uh, you know, here we're looking at the uh, most recent two quarters, the unrealized uh, gain or loss, uh, as it were, position. And we can see that the change from fourth quarter 21 to first quarter 22 was about uh, 5%. And just eyeballing uh, some of the uh, the individual readings here, you can see uh, a little more on the bottom left uh, on the credit union side. And uh, you know I think that's attributable to more of an emphasis on long callable bonds uh, and, and being underweight generally relative to banks, uh, mortgage-backed securities and with their amortizing features. Uh, so, in terms of portfolio durations, uh, there's not one number that we see on the call report and that we can point to, uh, but we can do some back of the napkin math because we know how much rates moved in the quarter, we know how much spreads moved in the quarter, and we can see what the change in, in market values were from the call report. And when we put all that together, uh, it implies that for most members, the investment portfolio durations uh, are about three to four years. So risk-based coverage, uh, uh, capital, excuse me. Um, uh, you know, I, I've used the phrase reluctant leverage an awful lot uh, over the last two years, uh, and that's because we've seen uh, uh, asset growth not because of conscious decisions on the loan side or the investment side, but just by, by simply being there and taking in deposits that uh, came flooding in at, at a his, historic pace. So that has stressed. Uh, uh, capital levels, and you can see the dark blue line there uh, that our banks um, uh, have seen their capital uh, come down by about a percent and a half. But uh, because loan activity hasn't kept pace with deposit activity, uh, risk-based capital uh, has held up, and in some and in many cases, even ticked up a little bit uh, higher. So the balance sheet is larger, you're levered up more, uh, but the, the amount of credit risk on the port or uh, risk on the portfolio on the on the asset side um, 
hasn't been one for one. Uh, credit unions, as many of our as all of our credit unions know, uh, the last quarter was um, introduction of some big time uh, uh, re call report reform, uh, which uh, risk based the calculation of risk based capital was a big part of that. Uh, so not everybody is subject to that, uh, uh, but what we did see for a first pass was that a uh, uh, similar story to banks in that um, risk-based capital uh, is, is relatively strong, uh, even though regular capital ratios are uh, uh, have been stressed by that reluctant leverage uh, phenomenon. So last thing for call report analysis uh, is margins and overhead. And uh, you know we, we saw an uptick in margin uh, over the quarter, and part of that are, is driven by some of the things that we've talked about. The um, you know you're getting a little bit of lift from uh, not changing your deposit rates and getting more, getting paid more on your cash, uh, but also the the, the, the transformation and or the remixing of more investments and uh, more loans. Um, but it's interesting to to put it uh, uh, side by side with non-interest expense, and we look at uh, non-interest expense in two ways, in percentages and dollars. And uh, you look at the trend in percentages in, with this line chart here, and you can see a pretty good trend when it comes to an expense that it that it that it's generally trending downwards. And that's that's one of the benefits of of asset growth. That uh, if your asset growth exceeds, uh, you know, the, the uh, the inflation in your overhead, then uh, you know you get some you get some expansion uh, in in your earnings profile there, and there there is some seasonality you can see there uh, in the fourth quarter uh, non-interest expense uh, spikes. However, when we look at it in terms of dollars, and those are those two call-out boxes on the right-hand side, we can see certainly in this inflation inflationary environment that it can be challenging to to manage uh, expenses and. So we went back and looked at the uh, most recent quarter uh, non-interest non -interest expense dollars versus pre-pandemic, and only 13% of folks uh, have less overhead today uh, than they did uh, back then. And in fact, 12% have um, overhead at least 25% above uh, where they were uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, certainly uh, expense discipline always helps uh but um it, it's certainly that much more uh magnified as uh there's margin challenges even though we think and hope that margin margins will continue to uh, uh trend positively so balance sheet strategies let's uh wrap things up by uh you know tying together what we talked about what's happening in the market in the, in the economy uh what's happening uh on our balance sheets and uh, what ideas uh, jump out as appropriate uh, and appealing. So, you know, if you're still sitting on uh, excess liquidity, um, you know, there's some opportunity here uh, to deploy that uh, with an emphasis on cash flow and, and modest duration. And, uh, you know, you can, you can really uh, amplify your earnings profile without adding a lot of risk. So here we're looking at a, a, a little, scenario analysis where um, we compare what happens if we buy a two-year treasury today at 261 uh, or we uh, keep that cash in interest on reserves currently earning us 90 but we know it's going to go up over time so we, we we do a little bit of a rate shock we assume uh, 225 basis points of hikes over the next year and for what that's worth uh, that is um, uh, more hikes that is currently being priced into the market and we see what is our, our at the end of the day, uh, how much interest we've earned on, on both of those two uh, approaches. And we can see even with that aggressive hiking assumption that the uh, IOR uh, really only squeaks out a nine basis point advantage. Uh, so, you know, this is a very robust uh, uh, shock here uh, in terms of the higher rates, but also um, you're probably not buying two year treasuries as in terms of where the, the middle of the road uh, investment activity is going to be. So if you think about, uh, you know, something like, um, you know, defensive MBS structures, uh, the math only works that much more in the favor of putting money to work. A couple of investment strategies, we're not gonna go through uh, all of these, but I will say that uh, it very, it didn't take much effort to come up with, you know, uh, 
this long list of ideas that jump off the page right now. And that's a testament to the fact that we really are in a new paradigm here, uh, given all the shifts in the market. Uh, and that creates opportunities. So uh, there's two things in particular I'll point out here is that uh, one, the, the health maturity designation is, is still an underutilized uh, option. And, um, you know, it'll depend on your institution whether you think, uh, you know, the horse is already out of the barn in terms of uh, putting uh, investments into the HTM uh, or if there's a need to continue to um, uh, protect against further market value uh, declines. Um, and then the second thing that I'll point out is the, uh, you know, the last one. And uh, we've certainly seen improved yields and improved spreads. Uh, but, you know, uh, there's still the potential uh, which creates the opportunity for further spread widening. So if you see yields or spreads widen out another 50, 100 basis points, and remember, uh, when asset spreads move like that, uh, in those periods of volatility are, are when uh, advances outperform in terms of not really moving by as much. So um, you could see an awful lot of spread, almost loan-like spread, uh, available on your core uh, investment universe uh, when thinking about investment le lever charities. So, so really the time to, to think about it and prepare is before uh, you get into those situations when uh, those opportunities and those windows open up. On the mortgage side, uh, again, similar to investments, we are in a completely different environment than we have been uh, for, for the last few years. So, um, you know, when you talk about conventional rates north of, well north of 5%, uh, two different products uh, come into a different light right now, uh, and that's jumbos uh, uh, pricing below uh, conventional mortgages. That's a function of the, the, the Fed intervention, uh, but also hybrid arms uh, and uh, being uh, comfortably uh, more than a point below um, conventional. So uh, if you have uh, demand and, and product capability there, uh, certainly with the amount of home price appreciation that we've seen uh, in our region, uh, you know, those are, uh, and which impacts uh, mortgage affordability on the payments for customers, uh, then those, uh, you know, the, the, the arms is, is something to consider. Similar story on the cash out refi. Uh, the refi, you know, the, the rate driven refis aren't falling out of the sky like they were in 2020 and 2021, uh, but uh, the math state may still work for cash out refis. Uh, season loan sales is something that we've been talking about and having good traction with a lot of folks. Um, uh, you know, you know what your interest rate risk and liquidity profile looks like right now. You know where you want it or would like it to be, uh, and you know what your short your your ability to withstand some some short term earnings bumps are. Uh, so if you're looking to to pull back on rate risk and and uh, buttress liquidity uh, profile, then season loan sales uh, may be an opportunity. So, uh, uh, you know, talk to your relationship manager or uh, MPF folks if you're a PFI and, uh, you know, happy to discuss that with you. And then uh, on retaining new production, we had mentioned that earlier, but uh, high rates, high spreads, that's, uh, that's music to the ears of uh, CFOs and treasurers. Uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, retaining production, uh, that puts uh, fixed rate mortgages in a better light. Deposits, we spent a lot of time talking about the negative impacts of rising rates on the asset side, uh, but we have to remember uh, that deposits are worth their weight in gold again. Uh, so here's, an, here, here's a little illustration of what happens to deposit prices uh, as rates move around. So uh, two examples, one would be a, in blue, a five-year non-interest bearing uh, checking account in the market value. Uh, and a three-year money market account uh, that prices at uh, effective Fed funds rate, so 100% uh, beta product. Um, and we discount these at where the marginal uh, dollar is at those terms. So three-year home loan make advance, three-year, uh, five-year home loan make advance for the checking account. And what we see is that as rates rise, uh, these low or no cost deposits are, are supremely valuable. Um, and you contrast that to uh, periods in 2018 and 2019 when the curve was flat, uh, that they uh, they don't have as much value. And you look at the you know the moves in just the last few months for the non-interest uh, checking account, uh, you know upwards of of 10 points and change. Well, 
uh, that helps offset some of the uh, negative moves that you may have seen from retaining those sub 3% fixed rate mortgages driven just by the, the need to sop up liquidity. So 40 minutes in, might as well mention something sp specific about uh, uh, advances. And uh, you know, I had teased it early in, uh, in the first couple sections uh, that some of the dislocations currently occurring in the markets are supportive of advanced pricing. Uh, and that is, is borne out by looking at this chart. So look at that green line where we look at our daily cash manager uh, advance uh, and looking at the spread versus the effective Fed funds rate. Um, so since the end of February, that spread has come down considerably from 32 basis points to six basis points. So uh, that creates opportunities that as you see uh, uh, ways to deploy excess cash in loans and investments uh, that you know that you can still meet your intermittent cash needs uh, pretty efficiently and pretty cost effectively. The marginal cost of funds, uh, you know, bonds and loans get all the hype, but I think uh, this is the most important asset liability management idea that is on the radar right now. What is going to happen with deposit flows? What is going to happen with deposit pricing? So, uh, you know, it's easier in, you know, the consensus, and you hear it in a million places, is that the industry has so much liquidity, betas are going to be low. Hopefully that is the case, but, you know, to play devil's advocate, you think about how relative to 2016, the last time where the Fed started to hike rates, it's, it's a lot easier to move your money around to chase yield in 2022. Uh, so uh, I would be committing resources and energy to, to know my deposit portfolio inside and out and running all kinds of uh, one uh, what if scenarios. So, um, you know, we're going to be doing an awful lot on the marginal cost of funds analysis uh, and, and happy to share some of our resources and, and conversations about ways to look at this. Uh, but, you know, one thing when you think about this, two bad things that can happen to a deposit portfolio, folks can switch or folks can leave. Um, and it, it really takes the art and science of, of saying, okay, if I hold my deposit rates at 10 basis points and knowing that I can backfill with advances at, you know, whatever rate and term that I decide, uh, am I going to fare better than if I proactively change, you know, offer a 1% special rate uh, to, to appease some of those depositors uh, who may be contemplating leaving? Uh, so that's where, you know, you want to apply uh, some assumptions in terms of what those uh, runoffs may be. And then uh, that'll tell you what the answer uh, in terms of should you offer higher rates or should you not, and then replace with uh, wholesale funding if necessary. Uh, we'll give you the answer pretty uh, clearly in terms of um, what is the most economical choice. Uh, let's see. Uh, an advanced strategy. So we talked about uh, narrow short-term spreads. So certainly uh, there's a plethora of, of reasons and, and, and ways that uh, that part of the curve, uh, whether it's marginal cost of funds, funding loan growth, the fact of, that you're probably more asset sensitive than you've been. Uh, so you know that is the uh, the combination, the good combination of factors of that's where you want to be, and that's where uh, pricing is attractive. So. Uh, you know, I'd encourage you to, to take a closer look there if you haven't already. Um, higher rate volatility. We've talked about uh, the spike in interest rate volatility. And if you've been paying attention to our emails, you've seen some of our spotlight offerings over the last few weeks uh, with our HLB option uh, advances as well as the SOFR uh, flipper advances. So those are uh, solutions that, that take advantage and benefit of this uh, uh, increased volatility environment. Um, so uh, certainly, you know, if you pair that with that marginal cost of funds uh, concept, uh, then you know that gives you that much more uh, support uh, to, to to defend your your deposit uh, franchise. Uh, forward starting funding is another thing that's picking up an awful lot of traction. Uh, the, the the flattening of the yield curve uh, helps make that pricing more favorable relative to the immediately dispersed rates. So, uh, you know, if, if the idea of separating out the timelines of when do I want to manage my risk right now, but maybe I need to delay some of my, the disbursement of the funds. I have 
CDs rolling off in nine months, um, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, then forward starting advance is a good solution on that front. Floating rate funding, similar story. You have interest rate risk and liquidity risk. And the point on the curve you want to be for both of those two metrics may not be the same thing. Your ALM profile may tell you that you want to fund as short as possible. You want overnight repricing risk. But if extending a little bit further out for your liquidity profile, whether it's because of ramping up on loans or deposit activity, uh, you know, outflow starting to occur, that you wouldn't mind being a little bit further out on your uh, advanced maturities, especially if the uh, pricing, pricing and the spreads are the same, which is the case right now then the floating rate funding uh, is something to consider as well, our sulfur uh, index advance. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of tools in the toolkit uh, and given the um, fluctuations and the uh, volatility in the markets, uh, the, there's probably a solution that um, can tick off a box or two. So with that, uh, that brings us to the end. Uh, so uh, you know, we'll wrap things up and, and I'll say that I'll, I'll thank everyone uh, for being uh, with us here today. I uh, really hope you found this to be useful. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, we are here to help. Uh, happy to share uh, any of the insights and resources that we have available to us. So uh, reach out uh, to us, to, to your relationship manager, and uh, we will uh, always do uh, what we can. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great day.